Great question. Uh, why was Mark placed after Matthew? And since we're there, why were the Gospels placed first to begin with? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very, very good question. The reason that question is so important is because, uh, let's first of all take why was Mark placed after Matthew? We have four Gospels recorded in the Christian canon. And as it turns out, Mark chronologically is earliest. Mark was written somewhere about the year 70, at the same time uh, during the destruction of the Second Temple. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know where it was written. If someone tells you they know, they don't know. But what we are sure of is that Matthew was had the book of Mark in front of him, as Luke did as well, the author of the book of Luke. We don't know who those authors are. These ascriptions are assigned in the second century. Really, Uranus, the uh, church father of uh, late second century of uh, Bishop of Lyon, originally from, from uh, Turkey. And uh, the reason, and the order that you see in a typical Christian Bible today, where Matthew is placed first and then Mark, is really attributed uh, largely to Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, which is modern day Algeria. And if you stop and think about what would have happened if Mark would have been first, again, we know Matthew is writing after Mark because. Almost virtually all of Mark is in the book of Matthew verbatim. Moreover, uh, Luke also is using the book of Mark, and both of them are using another source called Q, with, where, because Matthew and Luke share fewer than 300 passages verbatim. We've lost that source. But the key point is, if Mark is chronologically earlier than Matthew, probably about 15 years. So if you place Mark at 65, 70, move 15 years forward, and then you're going to get to Matthew and Luke, move 15 years after Matthew and Luke, you're going to get to the book of John. So the big question is, why not just start the Christian Bible with the book of Mark? And then what, all you have to do is play my little game called, what if? Imagine if that were the case, what would you do? If you opened up the book of the Christian Bible and you encountered the book of Mark first, what you would find, what would come into view immediately is the incipit, the introduction. And we are introduced to Jesus as an adult at his baptism, which means we have no infancy narrative, no virgin birth, no born in Bethlehem, none of that. That means we're meeting Jesus at his really one-year ministry, in this, as we find in other synoptic Gospels. Moreover, imagine uh, if all you, you started with Mark, how Mark ended. Bear in mind that although your Christian Bible ends at Mark chapter 16, verse 20, we know, and virtually all conservative scholars, I mean, we know that Mark 16, verse 9 through 20, I meaning the last 12 passages that you find in any Christian Bible, uh, these passages are a later interpolation. They were placed there long after whoever wrote Mark uh, assembled that book, which means, and you're going, well, what's 12 passages in a, in, in a book of more than 600? Well, those 12 passages, my friends, are the is the resurrection account. That means Mark 16, verse 8, uh, the women, Salome, Mary, encounter a man at the tomb. Presumably he's an angel. He's an all white. And he tells the women, why do you seek the Lord here? He is not here. He has gone to uh, Galilee. Tell the disciples to go to Galilee. There you will see him. And No. Then the end of this passage is, the women were terrified, were frightened, and said nothing to anyone. Said, didn't say a word. End of book. That's where the book ends. The, what you see now in 16, 9 through 12, where, uh, where we have um, encounters with Jesus, resurrection, uh, resurrection encounters, all that stuff, uh, where you have the famous stuff, if you take up any poisonous snake, it won't harm you if you drink anything poisonous. This is what the Appalachian churches base their theology on, and, and 
and sometimes die because they play with poisonous snakes. All of that comes from these last 12 passages. So if you started with Mark and then went to Matthew, every Christian will be asking the same question. Matthew is such an embellishment or it's such an improvement on Mark that why, like if Jesus was born a virgin, that's, an, that's a, a, a conception of epic, of Olympic proportions. Did, did Mark just forget to mention that point? He was born in Bethlehem, the city in which David was born. Did Mark just forget to mention that point? So today, the way Christians read the Bible is the way, uh, is a logical way, vertically. They start with Matthew, they, they've got their, Matthew starts off with his, um, with the genealogy, which goes through 16 or 17, and then goes to chapter 2, the infancy narrative, the killing of the innocents, and so on, and then finally Jesus winding up in Nazareth. So, therefore, what happens is people read through Matthew and go, okay, and they have this great account at the end. Let's say great. Matthew is a gripping book, make no mistake about it, and it is the Gospels that are most meaningful to Christians in general. So then when they get to Mark, it's kind of a blur that Mark doesn't mention anything about Jesus' uh, virgin, con that he was, he was conceived to a virgin, in, and he was born to a virgin in the city of Bethlehem. So they just go, oh, uh, I'm sure it was there. And that's how, that's why it was placed in that order. Uh, as far as why are Paul's letters, don't, why don't they appear first? That's a very good question. Because Paul, there are 13 books in the Christian Bible attributed to Paul. And the author claims to be Paul of the 13, seven of them are indisputably from the hand of Paul. In this Romans, Galatians, and so on. Now, these books, well, let's just, we'll just say the earliest book we have uh, in the Christian Bible is a letter called 1 Thessalonians, written about 4950. And again, this is, you can take conservative scholars, F.F. F. Bruce, you can go, basically, 1 Thessalonians is written about 4950. And essentially, everything that Paul wrote. That is, indis that is indisputably written by Paul, which will end with the book of Romans, is written during the 50s, okay? But the problem, it becomes compounded because if you, first of all, the storytelling of the Gospels is what is very, which means, a, which means so much to Christians because Christians love Jesus. And one of the things that's very striking about Paul's letters is Paul Almost, so there are a couple of exceptions to this. A Paul almost never quotes Jesus in his letters. It's, it's a, these are theological works. These are letters written to churches that Paul has built, that he is uh, throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, these are churches that Paul uh, put together, assembled, and then he's writing letters to them how to conduct themselves, how to conduct the churches, how to conduct themselves at the end of days. There's one exception that's Romans where he's writing to a church he's not yet been to. But the key point is Paul also doesn't mention a, Paul, not only doesn't Paul mention the sayings and stories of Jesus, which means everything to a Christian, uh, there are a couple of exceptions, so, but they're, they're very rare. If I ask most Christians, tell me where Paul is quoting something Jesus says, it would be very, you'd have to know your stuff. And you don't certainly have Paul talking about Jesus born of a virgin. It's nowhere found in, in Paul's letters. You have nothing in Paul's letters discussing that Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem. None of that's there. So what you want to do is you want to have Matthew, a very cr a creative work, a well-written work, which has every, which marks out, first of all, this is the, begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of uh, David, the son of Abraham, establishing that he was an ideal candidate to be the Messiah, a deeply flawed genealogy from verse 2 all the way through verse 16. When I say flawed, it is flawed. And then you have, he actually is removing names because he wants to get to 14, 14, and 14. It's, Matthew is just a, you know, 
But to most Christians, they have no idea. They're not going through Chronicles and comparing them. So Matthew gives the whole picture. He's got to go first. And again, this, this order is largely Augustine, the Bishop of uh, Hippo, who was uh, born in, let's say, I think about 354, 355, and he dies in 430. He's a major theologian. He's a very important force. He a, plays a very important role in 393. Uh, at a very important conference, he's, um, he's a, he's a, he shapes the thinking that would eventually uh, certainly have a, n the greatest impact on Calvin and so on. I mean, he's, he, so, and incidentally, one other point should be made. Only, it's only in 367 that we have the Bishop of Alexandria, who is the first person to ever provide us a list of the 27 books of the Christian Bible that we now have. I know this will surprise listeners, but we, of course, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John mentioned by Uranius at the end of the, Uranius at the end of the second century, let's say about the year 180, but that these are the 27 and nothing else, that the Gospel of Peter is not in, and Hebrews is in, and so on and so forth, and Revelation is in, and the, um, the uh, epistle of Barnabas is out. That, that we have in 367 by the famous Bishop of Alexandria, who in 325 was the very person who argued for the doctrine of the Trinity. So 367 we have our complete list. It's 27 books, which is very cool to Christians because it's 27. And what's 27? It's 3 to the power of 3, the Trinity. Perfect. <laughs> and, and so that's why Matthew has to go first. If Mark went first, every thinking Christian would go, what, what, how did, where did Matthew get this information from? Adon Olach, Asher Malach, B'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, B'chev Tzokol, Zai melech, azai melech, shemu nikrach.